So on Monday, uh, we have a test after spring break, but if you want, I can move it on uh, to Wednesday. If you go for spring break or if you have a job, it's up to you. Do you want me to move it Tuesday, uh, Wednesday instead of Monday? Right after spring break? Is that good? Wednesday for everyone? Did you hear? You don't care. Okay, Stephanie, Wednesday? Okay, so I will put an announcement. It will be on Wednesday after spring break. So remember, next week is spring break. And then test two is not cumulative. So it's only covering um, what we have, whatever we have been doing since test one. Okay, we put a post. I forgot what we did. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, multiple choice in person on paper as usual. So now I want to talk about spectroscopy. So remember the only way we have to get information about stars, galaxies, or any object in the universe is to collect light, okay? To have that light goes through some kind of prism. So it will split out the light into its component wavelength, okay? So we get what is called a spectrum. That will be a continuous spectrum. And superimposed to that spectrum, we have QR code, like black lines, okay? By analyzing the spectra, then we can tell everything about those stars or galaxies. Okay, so we can find their chemical composition, we can find their relative speed, we can find their density, their mass, everything we know is because of the science called spectroscopy. So if you look at if you look at Um, here, I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Oh yes, I forgot something. Last time I wanted to show you a very short, like they call that a short now, beautiful rainbow. <laughs> So we have natural prism in the atmosphere. So we have those little uh, drop, drop of water, so rain drop, and they will behave like a prism. And each little drop, okay, will split the light into its component, and then it will add up. So everything ha happen like you have a huge prism, and this uh, this is a beauty here. So I just forgot to show you that. So let's go back to this unit here. You see, when you look at the stars, you have a great diversity in, the, in stars and they come, all the stars come in different colors. Okay, so for example, you can have a red star, you can have a white star, you can have a blue star. And it turns out, and I'm gonna explain why, the color of stars only depends on their surface. Okay, on, on their um, surface, no. The color only depends on their surface temperature. Okay, so if you know exactly what, what's, what's the red here, right, exactly the wavelength of this red here, you will find its temperature. So here you have an example that will be, I don't know if you can see Orion, the constellation of Orion. Here you have Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a red star. It's a red giant. It's about to explode in a supernova, but we don't know exactly when it will happen. And this high gel here is a blue star. So we're gonna see that blue means hot. So a blue star is hotter than a red star. Okay, remember blue has a small wavelength, large frequency, compared to red. Red has a large wavelength and smaller frequency. 
So uh, that all started, all this understanding, the, the, the development of spectroscopy happened at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. So they, they developed what is called astrophotography. So the idea is that you have a telescope, okay, and then you have a photographic plate, and then you can use a long exposure, time exposure, so you see the, the stars are going to leave a streak and you can really see, you can really see the color and you can also see the brightness of stars. So all that was not very understood very well until the beginning of the 20th century with Max Planck and Einstein and modern physics. And then they started to understand why is a red star cool and a blue star is going to be hot. Turns out when you have something like this, okay, so this is a um, hot, uh, hot uh, stove, a hot coil, okay, and it's red. And it's not red because it was planted red, okay, it's not because someone put some red on it with marker, it's red because it's hot, it's red hot. Okay, so if you look at that color, that specific red, then you can tell the temperature. Okay, so this is called the black body. Okay, so that means that the color only depends on its temperature. And the amount of radiation it's going to emit, so it's radiation means energy, radiative energy only depends on its color. So that will be red hot. Okay. So here you have a, another stove, but this one is electric with gas. Is that red or is it blue? Obviously it's blue. So, but that means what? Is it hotter than this one or cooler than this one? Hotter, very good, because it's blue hot. Okay, so when the, what we call the black body, so anything that will burn energy like us, like the star, even like the Earth, even though it doesn't burn energy, it's going to emit infrared from the sun. We call that a black body because its temperature, okay, its radiation that it's going to emit only depends on the temperature. So this one is hotter. By looking at that blue here, I can tell exactly what's going to be its temperature. Okay? And so, not only that, so this, this um, physics was developed by Max Planck at the beginning of the 20th century and further developed by Einstein. The idea is that the color depends only on the temperature, but also the amount of radiation depends also on the temperature. So it means as you increase the temperature, the spectrum is going to be shifted to the blue and it's going to burn out even more energy. It's, it's going to have more oomph. Okay, you're going to have more radiation emitted. So, for example, we are human and we, we, what, what do we emit? Do we emit? We don't emit visible light, right? So, if we close all the uh, blinds here, everything is dark, we are not going to shine uh, blue or green or white. We're going to shine into, if we are alive, infra, infrared, right? So that's why in the military, they have those special Google night vision, and they can see in the dark anything uh, hot shining. So you can see people in the dark. So if we look at our spectrum, we're going to peak in the infrared. You can find the wavelength of the infrared we are um, emitting the most. Okay, so we can look at the infrared we are emitting the most. And by looking at that infrared, we can tell what is our temperature. Turns out that our temperature is about 97 Fahrenheit. Now, if you run a fever, you're going to emit more radiation. Okay, you know it's going to be hot, you're going to have a fever, so your uh, infrared radiation will have a smaller wavelength. By looking at that wavelength, we can tell 
your temperature. Isn't that amazing? Right? So, for example, they use that um, if, God forbid, someone has a cancer, for example, somewhere, like they do that for breast cancer. So they will um, they will put uh, some types of um, covering, like pants, special, special pants, um, and, and it will glow in the dark. And where is the tumor? It's going to uh, emit more radiation. So we, we, you will know exactly where the tumor is. So it's a non-invasive way to find where is the tumor located. So the tumor becomes like a black body. Okay, the amount of radiation it's going to emit, okay, uh, depends on on the temperature and the peak wavelength as well. So why this is happening? It's because, for example, if you take a star uh, inside the atmosphere of the star. All those molecules have kinetic energy because it's very hot, so they're going to move randomly in all directions. And actually, in physics, the definition of temperature is the uh, a measure of the kinetic energy of the molecule. So it's, if it's getting very, very hot inside the core, these molecules here are going to move faster so they're going to have more kinetic energy. So there will be more emission emitted at a higher frequency. So the thing that you have to remember is that a blue star is hotter than the red star. Red star will be cooler. Not only a blue star is hotter, but it has also a high metabolism. So it's going to burn the fuel very quickly, and it's going to emit more radiation. So that was found by Max Planck. Okay, so it's called the black body spectrum. So here we have our sun. Okay, and you see that our sun. So we split the light from the sun. Okay, even the X-ray, the gamma ray, the microwave, and the radio wave into its wavelength and how much how much of this wavelength do we have will be on the y-axis and you see that the sun is peaking in the green so typical question for test number two what's the peak wavelength of the sun it's going to be green however our eyes we don't see that green we mixed everything together that's why the sun will appear white now, there is a very simple relationship that we'll talk about by looking at that wavelength, okay? That wavelength of the photon that are most uh, emitted by the sun, we can tell its surface temperature. So that's amazing. You don't need to go to a hardware store, order a sun-like star, shove a thermometer into it, okay? We don't need to do that. The light is carrying this information for us. All you have to do is to look at the peak wavelength and you find the temperature of the star. Isn't that amazing? It's like, a, it's a great design. We, we can learn so much just for the light. Now what's gonna happen if I decrease the temperature? Okay, so maybe I have a red star. So, or even infrared star. So if I have a red star here, you see the red star is going to peak in the red. So it will appear red. I can also find its temperature by using the peak wavelength. And the area under the curve is just the amount of energy, okay? the amount of radiation burped out every second by by your star per uh, unit area so it just means that a cooler star okay um, will emit less radiation than the hot star that's why your hot star is going to emit so much radiation it's going to lose so much energy because soon enough soon enough it will run out of fuel so if you increase the temperature Okay, so again, this is called the black body curve for those who are in science. But you see, you increase the temperature. Now we get to Sirius. You remember the brightest star in the sky? And now we cannot even see this, the peak. So I don't know, should I do this? Okay, 
So I change the scale and you see that it's peaking uh, in the blue. Okay, so we're going to see a blue star. It's going to emit a huge amount of radiation and we can find its temperature just by looking at the peak wavelength. Okay, we can uh, go back. Now, if I decrease the temperature, I go to Earth. Earth will emit in the infrared. I, I don't know how to make it uh, to see it here. And then small. So anyway, I don't know how to play with that, but infrared here, you see the Earth absorb radiation from the sun and re-emit infrared. That infrared will be trapped into the atmosphere. That's, that's how you can have life on Earth, right? So we can find also the temperature of Earth. So planet, exoplanet, they don't shine into the visible spectrum. They shine into the visible light. No, what did I say? I'm spacing out. <laughs> in the planets, they shine into infrared, not into the visible light. Okay? So interestingly, you can use that to measure the temperature of space, empty space, far away from any star. Okay? So remember, what type of radiation is reaching us from space, from the universe, from all over the place? What type of radiation we can collect? That was a Nobel Prize in the 1960s. It's called the cosmic microwave background. Okay. So it doesn't matter which way you look at. You remember the antenna that was uh, spinning? Okay, you, you will scan the sky and everywhere from far away you collect this radiation, cosmic microwave background. By looking at that wavelength of this microwave background, you can tell the temperature of empty space. So you don't need to go in space, have a thermometer with you and, or, or a sensor and find the temperature of space. You can use that cosmic microwave background. It's quite amazing. And the temperature for free space, empty space, is about minus 550 Fahrenheit, minus 455 Fahrenheit. So it's quite cold just by collating the cosmic microwave background. So this is called um, Max Planck law. And then it was further explained by Einstein. So not to be confused, so obviously this is an orange and it's orange, but it's not orange hot. Okay, it's not orange because it's burning fuel and it's emitting radiation into the orange. Okay, it doesn't have a peak wavelength of orange. It's just that it's, it's another phenomenon. So it's absorbing white light from the sun, except orange. Okay, so if I look at, um, what's your name, mm, Dave? Dave? David, he has a green shirt. That doesn't mean that he's green hot, right? It just means that his t-shirt is absorbing, absorbing, absorbing all visible light except green. Okay, so it's like a filter. It absorbs everything but green. Okay, so this is not orange hot. Likewise, you see the ice appears to be blue, but it doesn't mean it's blue, it's hot blue, okay? It's just that it absorbs everything but blue. It's, it's scattering blue. Now, they didn't take Astronomy 1002 when they designed here the faucets in, in the sink, because you see hot is red and cold is blue. It should be switched, okay? Uh, blue should be hot and red should be cold. So if I ask you typical question for the test, um, a, a star, a red star is cooler than the blue star. Okay, so for those who just came, the test will be after spring break on Wednesday, in person, on paper. Okay, so we can even 
classify stars, and that was done at the end of the 19th century, even before they understood the physics behind it. You can classify stars according to their color and according also to their temperature, okay? Because color means temperature. So you have red star, that would be very cool star. And then the sun here is like a white star. And then here you have blue star. Blue star will be very hot, okay? And hot star will also be very big. And they will have also a very high metabolism. So you can look at some examples here. Our sun is an average star, is a white star and it mixed uh, all the color of the rainbow uh, to appear white. The temperature is about 5,000 degrees Celsius. Antares, we already talked about that star, and you see here, it's in the Scorpion, uh, 3,000 degrees, so it's cooler than the sun. We are talking about the surface temperature, and you have Betelgeuse here, which is a huge star but it's very fluffy so it's not very hot um, it's, it's still hot because it's big so it has a large surface area but it's not it's not as hot as our sun and as you go into the blue for example Sirius 10,000 degrees Celsius and then it's crazy hot okay so again, we know so much about stars because we analyze their spectra. So we have a continuous um, uh, wave. So you have the wavelength here, and here you have it's a continuous spectrum. And on top of that, you're gonna have those black lines. It's like a QR code, right? So here, living things, uh, emit in the infrared. And again, by looking at what type of infrared they are emitting, we can tell their temperature. Okay, so we human, we are here, nine. Uh, so we don't emit a lot of radiation, which is good, otherwise you're touching someone, you will burn yourself. So not a lot of radiation. And the wavelength we are picking in is in infrared, so we can find our temperature to be about 97 Fahrenheit if you don't want to use a thermometer. Okay, so you see cooler the star is, less radiation it's going to emit. Hotter, that means more radiation, more oomph, more energy being produced per second and per unit area. And the peak, peak wavelength here is more into the blue. So it's a little bit of physics in the nutshell, but not so much, right? Nothing to be afraid of. So that thing is the best example for you to understand. So you remember um, the cosmic, the microwave, uh, cosmic um, microwave background? Okay, so in 2001, and then in 2009, they sent two probes. So one was called uh, WMAP, and the other one was called Planck. So 2001 was WMAP and Planck. So what they did, they collected this microwave background coming from all direction. So they know now that the average temperature of space is about minus 455 Fahrenheit, just by looking, by looking at that wavelength. Isn't that crazy? And superimposed to this average, you see anomalies. Okay, so you're looking far, far, far away, and you see anomalies. So this dot here, that means the temperature is hotter. Okay, so that means the wavelength has been shifted a little bit to lower wavelength or higher frequency. And what's, what's happening here? That are galaxies in formation. So what you are looking at is the baby universe just after the Big Bang, okay? So we understand what the universe looks like, looked like at, a, like if you zoom, 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 zoom out. So surprisingly, it's very homogeneous, 
okay it looks the same everywhere you look that's because scientists think that the big bang at the big bang the universe um, e expanded but faster than speed of light so very quickly so the universe didn't have time to develop um, uh, something heterogeneous, right? So it's going to be homogeneous everywhere because of that expansion happened very fast. So it's quite, quite, quite a big, big, big uh, step here in our understanding of the universe, right? They are still working on that. Okay. So you have something called Vin's law, and for the assignment you will have. Oh, I have to post an assignment um, to use it, but it's very simple to understand. It just means that you have an inverse relationship between the wavelength and the temperature. It's an inverse relationship. So it means if the temperature is multiplied by three, the wavelength will be divided by three. Okay. So you can see for a temperature here of 5,000, that's going to be the wavelength. It's an inverse relationship between them. And there is a website where you can uh, even, so let's see. Um, I want to use that website. I'm going to use that website, I think, in a coming slide. But you, you put here the peak wavelength, and it's going to compute the temperature for you. And here you have the frequency. So this is called Wien's law. And then you have another equation here, also very easy to understand, that gives you the amount of oomph, energy produced by a star. That energy produced per second, so that means power, per unit area depends on the temperature to the fourth power. What does that mean? It means that if you multiply the temperature by two, okay, so the temperature of a star is multiplied by two, then the energy produced will be multiplied by two times two times two times two is eight, okay, eight times. So that means a hot star, okay, will burn its fuel very, very, very quickly, okay? So it will run out of fuel very quickly. So it will, um, it will burn, it will die, it will die young uh, compared to the other stars. So a blue star has a shorter life than the red star. Okay, it's also a very simple law, okay? It's not crazy math, it's just simple algebra nothing to be afraid of. So I told you here, so this guy here has a match, I think, in his hand. And you can see that, uh, of course, the temperature will be higher. So when you collect the infrared, the wavelength for this infrared here will be smaller than the wavelength here. So here it's not hot because he's wearing sunglasses. Okay, so you can use that technology to detect infection, for example, on the human body. You can use that technology also um, to look at a house when it's winter to see where the, the heat is leaking out, okay? So here is another example. You have a, so this is actually a brown dwarf, okay? So a brown dwarf, we're gonna see that next, is a failed star. It's a star that started to uh, fusion, started fusion, started to try to burn hydrogen into helium, and then it stopped. So it's a failed star, but because maybe that term is too offensive for the star, so we call that a brown star. So it's a star that uh, tried to start fusion, and then it failed. So this is a very cool star because it's not hot enough to sustain fusion. So it's going to emit in the infrared. Okay, so if I put uh, the temperature of that star to 2400K and I report that in the website, 200K, you will see here the the frequency and the wavelength, the peak frequency and the peak wavelength. 
Okay, so I don't know if I have an electromagnetic spectrum here. Oh, look at that, I have one. Okay, so how much, uh, what did we say? I forgot. No, the website, where well, is my website? So 2400 is the temperature, and you see the peak wavelength, the peak frequency is 141 terahertz. Tera is means a million of a million, okay, it's 10 to the 12. So I look that up here. Oh, oh, infrared. Oh, I am in the infrared here, 141. We, we, we are in the, in the near infrared here. Okay. So it depends, it depends like um, a microwave, of course, it's going to emit microwaves, obviously. Now, this brown dwarf here has an exoplanet, so it has its own exoplanet, even though it's not a star anymore. And that exoplanet has a temperature of this. And if you plug that uh, into your website, so what is it? 12 what? I forgot, 1240, something like this, 1240K. You're going to see the frequency will get smaller. So it's still infrared. So if you look it up here, it's still infrared, but it's farther infrared. So it's not as energetic. It has a lower frequency. Okay. Okay. So again, this science here, when you look at light, okay, from a star going through a prism, okay, so you can have a continuous rainbow plus black lines here. So this is called an absorption, absorption lines. And by looking at that, you can tell many things about the star, the density, the mass, the relative speed, and so forth and so on. So I have a video, a uh, short video. The video it's called Spectrum. Yeah. If you use a prism to spread out white light, you will see a continuous spectrum of colors. If you first pass the light through a cool gas, you will see dark lines or gaps in the spectrum. This is called an absorption spectrum because the dark lines are created when the cool gas absorbs these specific colors from the light passing through. If you heat up this gas until it starts to glow, it will produce an emission spectrum. Bright lines of color in exactly the same place as the dark lines in the absorption spectrum. These lines are the specific colors this gas emits when heated. Every element produces a unique set of lines, thereby making it possible to identify element. Isn't that amazing? You don't need to go and ask for a star in the hardware store and looking at the composition. You just look at the light. And you see those lines, so then you know that the star has this element here. If you see those lines here, you know that the star has carbon in it. If you see those lines, you know that the star has nitrogen, at least in its out self, uh, outmost layer, right? And then if the star has carbon plus nitrogen plus neon plus magnesium, everything will be combined. So it's like a message sent to us by light. Okay, we just need to understand the code. So it's like computer science, right? You just understand the code and, and you can decode. Oh, sorry. By looking at spectra. Thus, we can discover what the sun and other stars are made of by looking at the lines in their spectra. By studying these lines, we can figure out these distant objects' temperature, speed, distance, and age, among other things. If you use a prism to spread out white light, Right? So that's why it's called spectroscopy. So what's happening here, let's say you have the sun, okay, that will be the outmost atmosphere of the sun. So light goes through this atmosphere, and then when it gets out, you are missing some wavelength. You have wavelength deficit, okay? That's because those wavelengths have been absorbed by the atoms inside the cloud. And by looking at those black lines, it's like a QR code. You can tell what is in that cloud. 
So that cloud could be a nebula, or that cloud could be the outmost layer of the sun, okay? It's atmosphere or a star. That uh, small, um, the wavelength here, the photons that you are missing are being absorbed and then burned out in another direction. So this is called emission spectrum, but they complete each other. So what you are really interested in when you are doing spectroscopy is this absorption light. Okay, so again, if you look at the sun, okay, you see it's going to peak in the green, so we can find its temperature, okay, of the of the outermost layer, and you see that you are missing some of the wavelength here. Some photons are missing. By looking at those missing photons, we can tell what is the chemical composition of the sun. And that's how they found out about helium, that they named after Helios, okay? So it's like a, a code, really. It's quite, quite amazing. Okay, so this is called an absorption, absorption line spectrum. Okay, so again, the same thing here. Okay, looks like that. Those black lines are actually deficit into in, in wavelength. So it's like a barcode or QR code. It really looks like that. So when you see a black black lines on top of a spectrum, it's just to simplify, but it really looks looks like this, right? So here you have the peak wavelength. So here you have the wavelength. Here you have how many photons are being emitted at that wavelength, okay? And then you have those deficits here. Not only you can look at stars, but you can also look at galaxies. So this is called spectroscopy, and you have to be a really, really good spectroscopist uh, to, to decode, okay? Because it can be quite, quite complicated, okay? It's not just a rainbow. You don't just have one red. You have many, 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 many types of red, depending on the wavelength. And if uh, if you are good in and you are in this field, but just by looking at this, you can decode and understand the chemical composition and many more uh, things about the stars. Okay, is that clear? Not too much uh, science here. I didn't uh, scare anyone. Everyone is still here. You don't space out. Okay, so this is called a chemical fingerprint. And even before it was used by astronomy, it was first used by chemists. Even though they didn't understand what was going on, they still were able to use it. So it means if uh, you have a chemical plant, okay, um, burning something and you see some kind of smoke coming out of the chemical plant, so someone who wants to check if this chemical plant is not using not uh, legit chemicals that they are not supposed to use. You can look at the cloud through a prism, okay? And you can see, oh, oh, I see mercury. Uh, I'm gonna call for inspection. I'm gonna find them. And I'm gonna give them a fine. So it was used by chemists before it was understood by physicists. So if you look at the periodic table, I found a website. Some, sometimes it's, um, it's not there, but here it's there. So you see, if, if you click on hydrogen, you can have this um, spectrum. So this is only in the visible. You also have in the infrared, UV, X-ray, gamma ray, whatever. But uh, here, of course, you can only see visible light. And I've, he even played the music, depending on the wavelength depending on the frequency that you see. Okay, so every line will match with one frequency and one wavelength. Okay, so you can have helium. Okay, that's gonna be the spectrum for helium. That's what they have seen coming from the sun. So that's how they discover helium. I can play the music. <laughs> now if, you, if you like music, maybe you, you like that. Uh, if I have a heavy metal or, or heavy element, like, oh, let's, let's do xenon. 
So it's not a metal, but it's a noble gas. Can I do this? That's what you're going to see here. So each element has its own QR code. So, so what you get, the light from the star will be just a continuum, right, of all the colors of the rainbow. And now I'm going to add some atmosphere. Okay. So add some atmosphere. So if you add, okay, okay, we understand. Moving on. Add some hydrogen. You're going to see those lines. Maybe in the hydrogen, I'm going to have some helium. Then you're going to see those lines here. Right? So it's like a QR code. Okay? It's an atomic spectrum. Each element, okay? will be matched with a specific QR code. So that will be carbon. And then moving on, come on, come on quicker. You have calcium. And then moving on, someone is on the phone. Several people are on their phone. Oxygen, magnesium, and then come on, iron. And now if you combine everything together, so in the atmosphere of the star, you're going to have everything here. So you, you have all the lines okay, that you compare that to what you get in the lab and you can decode. I'm trying to make as simple as possible. I hope it's simple that you understand, right? It's like in a nutshell. Now, if you understand why, if you want to know why this is happening, okay, why is there deficit in wavelength? Okay, why are you missing photon? It's because if you look uh, at an atom, okay, you have electrons placed on energy level. Each electron are on specific energy level, right? So an electron, if it wants to go to a higher level of energy, it needs to absorb the right photon. So maybe this one is tired to be on the first level. Maybe he wants to jump to a higher level of energy. Okay? He wants to get high. And if he wants to get high, it needs exactly this photon, that purple photon. Any other photon will not make um, the match. Okay? It needs a photon with the exact energy to go from that level of energy to this level of energy. Okay, it's like an energy gap. So that photon will be absorbed by the electron. The electron gets quote unquote high. Okay. And then when it's gonna relax, it's gonna burn out that photon in another direction. As a consequence here, you have a deficit, you are missing the purple photon. Do you understand? Maybe he wants, doesn't want to get so high, just a little bit high, right? So it needs a red photon because red photon has less energy. That photon will be um, enough to make to the second level of energy. A okay? little bit of um, gap, but not that much. So it's going to absorb that photon with that specific energy gap. So it gets high and then it's going to go back, burping out that red photon, but in another direction. So you are missing that red photon. So red photon is missing because one electron uses it to make it to here. That purple photon here is missing because it, uh, one electron uses it to go there. And you are also missing that uh, light blue photon okay, that were used by the electron to make it to one to uh, three to the third energy level. And it's gonna be burnt out in another direction. Isn't that interesting? So that was understood only in the beginning of the 20th century with Einstein, Max Planck, and all the physicists uh, that developed modern physics, okay? Even though that technique was used by chemists to tell what are the chemicals that you can find in a, in something that is burning or in a flame or in a cloud, um, it, only the physicists uh, were able to explain that. Okay, I didn't lose 
lost anyone? Everyone is here. Okay, so that's uh, the explanation. So that will be, um, I think, the, the spectrum for the sun. Okay, um, I think it was done by this guy, Fraunhofer, and I think he was a school teacher. I have to check this out. But that will be the spectrum that you get from the sun. Okay, that's how they discover helium. Okay, so not only you can tell what is inside the atmosphere of a star, but you can also tell what is in a nebula. Okay, because behind, in the background, you have stars. Okay, the stars, the light from the star going through the cloud will excite the electrons inside that cloud that will burp out all those photons in all the direction. So it will make that uh, nebula very colorful, but also you can understand what is it is made of. Okay, so not only you can find the composition of stars, but also of nebulae. Okay, and you have those beautiful colors here. You can read along. Okay, that will be in the constellation Aquila. Uh, oh, wow. Oh, beautiful. Amazing. This is the most beautiful thing you see um, uh, when, a, when a star dies. This is called the planetary nebulae. And that's what will happen to our sun. There is no planet. It's just the name that was given before they understand what was going on. At the end of a star like our sun, it's going to burp out, but not violently, gently. Okay, it's going to burp out, it's going to be a gentle burp, all its outmost layer, and you have this beautiful display of color. And left behind is a white dwarf. So our sun will become a white dwarf. So that's a corpse, that's a dead remnant, okay, when, when it's done burning helium or fuel. Oh, wow, look at that, just on time.